and uh, she heard the voice of God. Well, all I have to say to that is, if you want to hear the voice of God, then read the scriptures audibly. If you want to hear the voice of God, then read the scriptures out loud. This is the way that God speaks. This is the way that God speaks. Through his written word and through the living word, his son. The psalmist said it this way in Psalm 119. Open my eyes so I can truly see the marvelous things in your law. Give me understanding so that I might observe your law and keep it with all my heart. Guide me in the path of your commands, for I delight to walk in it. So how can I understand God's word? How can I know the truth? How can I understand the Bible? Look at your Bible for just a second. Your your copy of the Word of God. I assure you, God wants more than you want for you to know what He said. He revealed it to us so that we might know it. John 6, verse 68, Simon Peter answered the Lord, To whom will we go? You have the words of eternal life. So those are pretty important words. If they are the words of of eternal life, and God most necessarily wants us to know those words. Those words of eternal life, we have found out so far, that the preacher is supposed to faithfully proclaim, proclaim those words because God has revealed His perfect Son and His perfect Word to us. All those words are inspired. Every single solitary one of them. So that the Bible is clear, it's authoritative, it's sufficient, it's infallible, that is, it will not mislead you. It is inerrant, that is, there are no errors in the Bible, and it is complete, it is the faith once delivered to the saints. There are no more revelations, there are no more words from the Lord. The word that we have is the definitive word of the Lord, and the son that he has given is the definitive word that he has given given. As we saw last week, you can trust the Word of God because it's a book like no other. It leads to the greatest wisdom, the fact that we can know Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. It is the very breath of God. It is beneficial to us in many areas of our life, and it prepares us for the work of God. So, so far we have looked at the thought of revelation, the fact that God has made things known about himself that we would not otherwise know. So revelation speaks to the content of your Bible, all the information that is contained therein. The way that God gave us that, the method that he chose was inspiration. He literally breathed his word out through sinful men, and yet he overshadowed that, and he gave us a perfect word. So what we're speaking about today is illumination. Illumination, which is not to be confused with revelation, the content that we have, or the, meaning, or the, uh, the inspiration, the method that he chose. Illumination has to do with how can I know what the Bible means? Some of it is easy, quite frankly. When I look at Psalm 23, verse 1, and it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want... There's not much interpretation. I know what that means. The Lord is my guide. What else could I want? He's everything to me. But then when you get to the book of Revelation, man, that takes a little study. That takes a little wherewithal. So illumination has to do with discovering the meaning. Illumination. It is the ministry of the Holy Spirit whereby He enlightens believers so they can comprehend the Word of God. The ministry of the Holy Spirit where He enlightens believers so that they are able to comprehend the Word of God. Now let me stress that last part. Where they can comprehend the Word of God. Eliminate, illumination is just dealing with that. The Word of God. You can study your Bible. And you should but it's not going to help you do calculus. 
Believe me, I know. It's not going to help you conquer trigonometry. Even though God may honor your study of the Bible and help you with those things, illumination has to do with understanding the meaning of the Word of God that we have before us. And so at salvation, a wondrous thing occurs. God does a lot of things when we get saved. One of the things that he does, not only does he change us from the vile creature that we were into a new creation, he also sends the Holy Spirit to live within us. He indwells us at the moment of salvation. There are no second blessings in the sense where we get a baptism of the Holy Spirit later on. You get all of the Holy Spirit the day you get saved. The question is thereafter is, does the Holy Spirit have all of you? But we get all of the Holy Spirit that we're ever going to get the moment that we get saved. That's one reason why I believe in security of the believer. He's never going to give the gift that he gave to us back. God is not a gift giver. Uh, 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 he, not in the sense that he's going to take the gift that he gave us back. Once he gives us the Holy Spirit, we always have the Holy Spirit as an abiding presence in our life. In the upper room, uh, John 14, 15, 16, and 17, he gives the upper room discourse. And a lot of that, he's talking about how it's going to be after he leaves. And he's talking about the Holy Spirit. In chapter 14, he says, But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. That is, all things pertaining to me as I have revealed them in my word. He will teach you. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. And he will remind you of everything I have told you. And then in chapter 16, he says, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. So not only is he our teacher, he's our guide. He shows the way of the meaning of what God has revealed about himself. He will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own. It's problematic when a Christian group or a group, when they emphasize the Holy Spirit to the detriment of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Nothing wrong with studying the Holy Spirit. Nothing wrong with believing in the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit came not to shine a light on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came to shine a light on Jesus. And so he says, He will not speak on his own, but he will speak whatever he hears. He will also declare to you what is to come. He will glorify me as opposed to himself. He will glorify me because he will take from me what is mine and declare it to you. He is our teacher. This guarantees a ministry to us. God himself, who lives within us, has chosen to give his spirit who will teach us. That's not for a select few. That is for all the people of God. If the spirit lives within you, you have the teacher living within you. This teaching encompasses all truth. He even says there, even the things to come. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is to glorify Christ and His sufficiency. If you're there in 1 Corinthians 2, we were there just a couple of weeks ago, about three weeks ago. Remember when we were talking about the word of the cross. The word of the cross is perceived by the world as a, it's a foolish message. It's a foolish, foolish method, that is, the preaching of the cross. And even the messengers many times are considered fools by the wor world. But it is really the wisdom and the power of God. And so when Paul begins to write the book of 1 Corinthians, those first two chapters he writes in such a way so that it might humble the proud and show us that the only true wisdom that there is in the world is the wisdom of God. There's no amount of cleverness that we can give. There's no amount of cleverness that we may share 
that would somehow get us to God. Only God can do that in his wisdom. And so as we're thinking about 1 Corinthians and just those two first chapters especially and even the text today, we're thinking about how God confounds the world because of a simple message that he gives and his wisdom, his foolishness is actually greater than man's wisdom. Not that God's a fool. But his foolishness if we could compare it, is greater than our wisdom, Paul would say. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning with verse 9. <clears throat> but as it is written, what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no human heart has conceived, God has prepared these things for those who love him. Now God has revealed these things to us by the Spirit. Since the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except his spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who comes from God, so that we may understand what has been freely given to us by God. We also speak these things, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual things to spiritual people. But the person without the Spirit does not receive what comes from God's Spirit, because it is foolishness to him. He is not able to understand it since it is evaluated spiritually. The spiritual person, however, can evaluate everything, and yet he himself cannot be evaluated by anyone. For who has known the Lord's mind that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So as we look at this text today, uh, we're dividing it up in three sections and you'll note uh, that each of these sections has something to do with a person of the Godhead, one of the persons of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit. And so the first one, uh, verses 9, 10, and 11 have to do with you will begin comprehending the depths of the Spirit. So as I think about this text, what I'm thinking about is this. This is what I want you to understand when you walk out of this building today. You can understand God's Word if God's Spirit lives within you. You can understand God's Word if God's Spirit lives within you. And so as God and His Holy Spirit illumine His Word, you're going to begin three major actions. And the first one is, you will begin comprehending the depths of the Spirit. Illumination, quite frankly, is a work of the Holy Spirit. It's not something that's mystical and not something that we stand back and go, ooh and ah. It's the teacher that lives within us pointing out what he wrote. After all, he inspired men to write the scriptures, so he is the author of the book. Isn't it a wonderful thing to know that we know the author? He lives within us, and so we can actually begin to comprehend the depths of the Spirit. Verse 9, which is a, a, a verse that is commonly taken out of context. I had one pastor that I sat under for about four years. Every time he would come to this verse, and on the occasions that he would talk about heaven, he would talk about this verse. If this verse has anything to do with heaven, it's only about that much. Because what he has to talk about is something totally other than heaven. Now, I would be the first, thing, first one to say that God has gone away. Jesus has gone away to prepare a place for us that where he is, we will be with him also. Correct? Yes. So he begins here by saying, but as it is written, he's hearkening back to the words of the prophet Isaiah. What no eye has seen... No ear has heard, and no human heart has conceived. God has prepared these things. These things what? 
that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no human heart has conceived. God has prepared these things for those who love him. What he is talking about in context here is the wisdom of God that we are privy to because of his word. No eye hath seen, no ear hath heard, no human heart can comprehend what God has shared with us through his word and through his son. It's his incomprehensible goodness that God has never shared up until he decided to share it. Now, aren't you glad that God decided to share himself with us? Because we wouldn't know anything about God unless he chose to reveal himself to us. We can't imagine what God has prepared for us in the Christian life. That's not only heaven, but that's everything that is involved in the Christian life. Who would know? Who could calculate that God could call Somebody to preach that has absolutely no confidence in front of people and would rather do anything else in that moment when God called me. No ear could hear that. No eye could possibly see that. No human heart could comprehend that. And I'm still trying to figure it out. But God, in his wisdom, has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And so, it's his incomprehensible goodness that he has never chosen to share, but he chose to share. It's what he has in store for us in the Christian life. And third, we may know some things via the Holy Spirit right now. Look at verse 10. Look at verse 10. Verse 9 is not talking about just heaven, if it's talking about heaven at all, because he said the reality is those things that the mind cannot, or the heart cannot comprehend, the eye cannot see, the ear cannot hear. He says in verse 10 with the first word, now, not later, not when you die and you go to heaven, but now God has revealed these things to us by His Spirit. He's revealed, Revelation, these things to us believers, not humanity, to us, how did He do it? By the Spirit, since the Spirit searches everything. Not that the Spirit's ignorant, because the Spirit is omniscient as well, but He is searching the deep things of God on our behalf so that we might know the deep things of God. So there's one thing that the Spirit is doing in this text. He searches everything, even the depths of God. The depths of God. That's pretty deep. He gives us an analogy in verse 11. A little, an illustration, by the way. He says, For... Who knows a person's thoughts except his spirit within him? Now, the, this word spirit there is a small s because he's talking about the spirit of a man. Let me ask you, do you know what I'm thinking right now? No. You have no idea what I'm thinking right now. Would you like to know? Tough. You can't know because only I know what I am thinking. Only I know what I'm thinking. By the way, only you know what you're thinking. You may be thinking, man, preacher's tearing up this morning. This is good stuff. And then again, you may be thinking, what time is the tip-off? What time is the kickoff? What time is the first pitch? Well, that's what he's saying there in verse 11. Who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit that is within him? In the same way, by way of analogy, in the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. And the spirit of God is searching the deep things of God. 
See, it's not... Our understanding of the Bible is not based on smarts. It's based on surrender to God. It's not based on intellect. It's based on our intimacy with the Spirit. I think about that great preacher, D.L. Moody. He may have been the greatest evangelist that ever walked this planet. He literally shook two continents for the glory of God. Europe and North America. Built the great Moody Church in Chicago. Great preacher of the Word of God. You know, D.L. Moody had a fifth grade education. Not a matter of smarts in understanding what God says and what He means. It matters how much you are surrendered to God and how intimate you are with the Spirit that lives within you. Those are the things that decide whether we understand the Word of God or whether we don't understand the Word of God. Because you see, there he says at the latter half of verse 11, in the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. But here's the great thing. The Holy Spirit, who understands the things of God and the deep things of God, lives within every believer. He lives within every believer. So secondly, you will begin comparing the truths of God. So not only comprehending the depths of the Spirit, you will begin comparing the truths of God. Verse 12, Now we, that is believers, have not received the Spirit of the world, the Spirit of the age, the Spirit of the cosmos. We're, we're not walking in the ways of the world. We have not received that Spirit but here's the spirit that we have received. But the spirit who comes from God. So not only does he teach us. Here this is telling us that he indwells us. He lives within our very being. And here's the reason he does that. So that or because. Here's the purpose. So that. Here's the reason. One of the reasons why he lives within you. So that we may understand what has been freely given to us by God. God freely gave us His Word. He doesn't intend for it to be a mystery to us. He intends for us to understand what it means. Verse 13. We also speak these things, these words that are freely given to us. Not in words taught by human wisdom. So what Paul is saying is, I don't proclaim God's word by human cleverness. I don't try to get people down the aisle. I don't try to manipulate them. I just preach God's words and God does the rest. He says we also speak these things. We declare these things. Not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those words taught by the Spirit. So not only does he search, that is the Spirit, he indwells, and here he also teaches. And I would like to think as I'm declaring the Word of God, that the Spirit of God is teaching. He says explaining, your Bible may say comparing, explaining spiritual things to spiritual things people. The Roman Catholic Church has traditionally said that the reason that the Bible is so hard to understand is because of its obscurity and because of its perplexity. Therefore, because the Bible is so obscure and the Bible is so perplexing, you need the church to explain it to you. That's why when you get in a discussion many times with a Roman Catholic, they will say something along the lines of this. Well, this is what the church says. This is what the Pope says. This is what my priest said. I learned a long time this little rule. Jesus loves me. This I know. Not because the Pope told me. And not because the church told me. But because the Bible 
tells me so. That is the reason. The reformers came along after, uh, after the Reformation and they said, well, it's understanding the Bible, the problem is not its perplexity. The problem is not its obscurity. The problem is not the Holy Spirit. The problem is not even the human authors that wrote it. The problem with understanding the Bible is our sin. That's the thing that keeps us from understanding the Bible. So what you need is not the church. What you need is the Spirit that lives within you. Well, it just so happens that He does. And He's the teacher and He's the guide. So, ultimately, third, you will begin cultivating the mind of Christ. He begins in verse 14 by saying... But the person without the Spirit, that is, as opposed to those in 13, spiritual things being explained to spiritual people. Verse 14 is talking about another type of person. But the person without the Spirit, that is, the natural man, the unregenerate man, the person that is not saved. We all know some of those. But the person without the Spirit does not receive. It's actually a word that's used in the Bible many times to, to acknowledge somebody that is welcoming somebody. So you could actually substitute the word welcome there. But the person without the Spirit, the lost person, does not welcome what comes from God's Spirit. And why is that? Because it is foolishness to him. He is not able, he does not have the capability, he does not have the mechanism in order to discern. Because the Holy Spirit doesn't live within him. He does not have the capability to know what God's inspired word says because he does not have the author living within him. He is not able to understand it since it is evaluated, discerned, judged spiritually. That's not to say that lost people cannot attain a high level of knowledge about the Word of God. I got uh, commentaries in my office where people are experts in Greek and Hebrew. I can think of two right off the top of my head. They're very proficient in the biblical languages. They wrote books on theology that are bestsellers. The only problem is when they died they probably went to hell. You can attain a lot of knowledge about the Bible. But the problem is sometimes people refuse to act on the knowledge that they have been given. By the way, spiritually dead people cannot respond. You can go to the funeral home anytime this week. You can go look at an open casket, and I assure you, none of those people are going to respond because they are dead. Spiritually dead people cannot respond. They may have facts, but they don't have faith. Therefore, to them, it is foolishness. It's not a matter of ignorance. It's a matter of illumination. It's a matter of illumination. In my time as a pastor and a, a teacher of the Bible, I have seen this fleshed out in several ways. There are probably more than this, but uh, the ways that I have seen them fleshed out are this. I have talked to people before, and, you know, quite frankly, they could care less about God and the things of God, and they will never visit the house of God that's why I'm so adamant when I do weddings and funerals, I'm going to preach. Because some of those people that are going to be there would never be there otherwise. It's the only shot I get at them. They, they refuse to hear the things of God. Then there are those that may sit in a congregation and quite frankly in here long enough, I've been around long enough that I can spot them a mile away. Move me if you can. 
Well, it's not my job to move you. It's God's job to move you. And I'll just be quite frank with you. If God decides to move you, you, you will be moved. You will be moved because he is sovereign. And then there have been other times when this type of person has come to my class or in a different setting and maybe they're there and it's not because they're inquisitive, but have you ever had somebody that just dominates the class? They just dominate it for the sake of gathering information and you wonder why they are so inquisitive when they never do anything with the information. Why is that? Because ultimately, the information is only as good as the faith that possesses it. The same sun that melts the wax hardens the clay. You hear the word of God and instead of responding in an appropriate fashion, you just turn hard to the word of God. Hmm. You can't understand God's word if you have God's spirit. So let me ask three questions real quick. Is the word speaking to you? Not just in this moment, but in, in the previous days. Is the word speaking to you? Are you like those two that were walking with Jesus on the road to Emmaus? And they were talking to each other as Jesus was explaining the scriptures. Here's what they said. Weren't our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? That should be every child of God. Hanging on every word that God says. Because ultimately if the preacher is doing his job, he's preaching the words of Jesus. And your heart should burn within you when you hear those words explained. See, illumination means asking God to teach us. Illumination means the Holy Spirit shining a light on the truth that we have. Illumination means the Holy Spirit working in harmony with the Word and just that. And what I mean by that, I hear people say, like my relative, this and that and whatever. The Holy Spirit is never going to do anything contrary to the Word of God. Never! Ever! If you can't compare it and find it in the Word of God... Your antennas should be going up. Illumination does not mean that we can know and discern everything. After God, after all, God is God. He chose to reveal what he revealed. That's not to say that he revealed everything. Deuteronomy 29, 29. Listen to this. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. But those that are revealed belong to us and our children forever so that we might obey all the words of this law. The secret things belong to the Lord. But what he's revealed, it belongs to us. Come on now. It belongs to us. Illumination does not eliminate the need for human teachers or else he wouldn't have called people to teach, called people to preach. Illumination does not eliminate need for diligent Bible study. I prepare like it all depends on me. And then I preach like it all depends on God. Because it does, in both senses. Eliminate, illumination does not guarantee we will all agree. You know, it just so happens we're not the only church meeting in Bowie, Texas today. There are all sorts of flavors of Baptist. There are all sorts of flavors of other denominations that are meeting today. We all love the Word of God. Why is it that we can't all agree? You know why that is? I can't help the color of my skin. 
I can't help that I was raised in the deep south. I can't help the parents that I had. I can't help the preachers that I sat under. I can't help any of the cultural baggage that I bring to the table when I'm trying to interpret the scripture. And sometimes a lot of that stuff gets in the way. That's why we're over here and all of them are over there because we see things differently. And that's okay. But we're all trying to figure out what God said. Ultimately, illumination is not only discovery of facts. The very last word that he said was, For who has known the Lord's mind? that we may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. See, having a men's Bible study or coming to church to hear the preacher preach or going to Sunday school, if you're just going to gain facts, stay home. Facts are only as good as that last part. But we have the mind of of Christ. Preaching and teaching is good, but it's not just good for information, it's good for transformation. If we're not being made more into the image of His dear Son, we're missing something. We should be more like Jesus every single day. Is the Word speaking to you? Is it a lie? Is the word simply not exciting anymore? Well, as a believer, the Holy Spirit lives within us. But he is a person. And we can grieve him. And we can quench him. There are several ways. We can just be so carnal that we can quench him. And we can grieve him. People of the flesh. Paul called them babes in Christ. We can be indifferent. Whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, he was talking about Melchizedek. And uh, he said, you know, he had more to say, but here's what he said. It's difficult to explain since you have become too lazy to understand. Sometimes we just become indifferent to God's word. And then there's this little thing of traditions. If a tradition's good, that's great. But sometimes traditions are not good. Never done it that way before. We've always done it that way before. Mark 7, verse 13. Here's what Jesus said in regard to bad tradition. You nullify the word of God. Did you get that? You nullify the word of God, which Jesus said, on the other hand, would last forever and ever. Not one jot or one tittle would pass away. You nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And then ignorance. Mark 12, verse 24. Isn't this the reason why you're mistaken? You're ignorance. You don't know the scriptures or the power of God. And then last but not least. Is the word simply dull, boring, lifeless, uninteresting? Can I share a reason for why that may be? Because he said spiritual things are discerned by spiritual people. It may be that the word is dull, boring, lifeless, and uninteresting because you cannot understand it because the Spirit of God does not live within you. Only believers can experience illumination of the totality of God's Word. Lost people can only hope to understand illumination of the gospel message. So let me give you the gospel message. And I hope, if you're lost, that God opens your heart to understand the words so that you may respond. Jesus is God's Son. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for your sins and mine. He poured out His life on our behalf. The sinless Dying for the sinful. They put him in a borrowed tomb. He conquered death. He conquered hell. He conquered the grave. And three days later, 
He arose so that we might experience forgiveness and new life. If you can't respond to that, if you can't have faith in that, you will never understand the rest of God's Word. Acts 16, 14. The Lord opened her heart, that is Lydia, to respond to what Paul was saying. Lost person, I am hoping that God is opening your heart right now. Move me if you can. Well, he'll move you. Your palms will get sweaty. You'll get a big old lump in your throat. You'll hold on to that pew with every fiber of your being. You'll make every excuse that you can make not to come to God today. You can have a head full of facts and still go to hell. The devils believe and they tremble. They are more orthodox than we are. They have more facts than we do. But it doesn't do them much good, does it? Let's pray.